Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Three alien abductees investigated by the late Bud Hopkins are intriguing. Not so much for the abductions themselves, but of a seemingly trivial detail involving bizarre interview scenarios that each woman experienced. As Hopkins investigated these curious setups further, he arrived at the conclusion that they are seemingly another layer of the alien abduction phenomena. Of particular concern is the notion that these truly strange encounters are suggestive of an end goal of a hybridization program being directly connected to alien abductions, and that the people themselves were actually alien-human hybrids, carrying some part of the mission to this concerning agenda. Of course, what the end goal of this alien-human hybridization program might be is another topic of debate. Are aliens looking to invade Earth discreetly without us even being aware of it? Or might they simply leave and venture elsewhere once their program's goals have been achieved? Tonight, we'll look at the strange case of the multiple abductions of one woman and testimonies of other abductees who, while abducted, were manipulated somehow to believe that what they were seeing was ordinary people, items, and buildings, as opposed to the possibly grotesque and horrifying reality that was truly in front of them at the time. Was it done through mind control? Alien implants? And why do so many of these abductees see humans alongside the extraterrestrials? I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, odd alien abductions, alien implants, humans being seen during abductions, and mind-manipulated extraterrestrial interviews. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Cases we are about to examine are documented in the book Sight Unseen – Science, UFO Invisibility, and Transgenic Beings by Carol Rainey and Bud Hopkins, although the investigation was carried out by Hopkins. I'll place a link to the book in the show notes. After preparing a 25-point questionnaire on alien abduction for the December 1987 edition of Omni Magazine, Bud Hopkins, as the questionnaire had requested, began receiving correspondence from people who believed that they had indeed been the victim of alien abduction. One such response came from a New Jersey 32-year-old housewife and mother of three who Hopkins gave the false name Terry Winthrop, and for whatever reason, it stood out to him. In it, Terry details an account that took place 14 years previously, around 1973 or 1974, when she, who was three months pregnant at the time, and her ex-husband were driving home following a visit to the Jersey Shore. 
It was late afternoon, and the sun was still bright and high in the sky. Then, however, something truly strange happened. In the letter, Terry states that the next thing we both knew we were sitting in the parked car, and it was dark, and we were in a place we'd never seen. As they grappled with what had happened, they came to the conclusion that there were around two to three hours that they could not account for. And what's more, they had the feeling that when they found themselves in the parked car, they had only wakened up moments earlier, almost as if they had been brought out of some kind of bizarre trance. They could also see that they were in a barren sort of field, with absolutely nothing at all around them and with no memory of how they had arrived there. Eventually, after gathering their sense somewhat, they put the car in motion and slowly found their way back to the road. However, even when they did, it was a road that they were not at all familiar with, and so they were uncertain of which direction to set off in. Ultimately, they eventually found their way back to the road to take them home, and once there, the pair pretty much put the incident out of their mind. However, when Terry read the article that accompanied the alien abduction questionnaire, she had a sudden flash or memory about the incident, which eventually led her to contact Hopkins. In the same letter, Terry also went on to detail a strange event that occurred much more recently, in the summer of 1986. She would state that it was a very warm, clear, beautiful night, and she was outside sitting at her picnic table and looking up at the stars. As she did so, she noticed a strange star that appeared to be throbbing and pulsating, making it appear as though it was going forward and backward. She watched this strange star for several moments, almost going into a relaxed state from its glow. Then, for reasons she couldn't explain, she decided to turn her attention to her right. There, just above the next road, was a very large vehicle that was just hovering perfectly still, somewhere between 20 to 30 feet above the ground. She sat up a little so she could see the object a little better through the trees that surrounded her garden, all the while thinking to herself that this can't possibly be real. She described the object as being pentagon-shaped, with red, blue, green, and white lights along the side. In total, she watched the object for between three to four minutes before it moved forward, slowly and up with a gradual incline. Then it suddenly took off real quick, disappearing from sight in an instant. In a further twist, although the witness did not sense any missing time as she had done with her husband a decade and a half earlier, when she returned inside the house and checked her watch, it was much later than she thought it was, although she consoled herself that she was simply outside longer than she thought she had been. Terry would return outside for another cigarette a short time later, this time to the front porch. Amazingly, the same object, or at the very least an identical one, appeared from over her house, remaining silent as it moved, before disappearing into the distance. Hopkins immediately sensed from some of the details in the letter that Terry was a credible witness, not least as she had no point in her correspondence insisted she was a victim of alien abduction, and questioned several times if there was a more rational explanation. She also questioned her own version of events several times, asking if it was her imagination or that she couldn't be sure about certain details. Furthermore, it was also clear that she feared Hopkins himself would believe her to be a crackpot. However, more than that, Hopkins picked up on certain details that suggested to him that not only was the missing time episode in the 1970s likely an abduction encounter, but the incident outside her home in the summer of 1986 most likely was too. Hopkins highlights how quite often in alien abduction cases the abductees often find themselves doing something new or unusual immediately before their abductions, with Hopkins even suggesting that this is as if the UFO occupants were somehow able to compel behavior that facilitated the abductees' capture. We might recall that on that evening, Terry felt a sudden urge to go outside and look at the stars. Was this something that was instilled in her by her abductees? In fact, it was her description in her letter to him about that second sighting 
that also drew Hopkins to Terry as a credible and genuine witness. As he highlights, even though she had memories of that strange evening with her ex-husband in the 1970s, she had not even entertained it could have been connected to UFOs, much less alien abduction. However, upon seeing the strange object from her yard just short of a decade and a half later, she suddenly recalled that evening once more. As Hopkins writes, one might be tempted to suggest that she did so because subconsciously she knew the two incidents were real. Another detail that Hopkins picked up on was the fact that despite the highly unusual nature of the events in her yard, Terry felt no fear, something which surprised even herself. Ultimately, Hopkins would meet with Terry and eventually she would undergo hypnotic regression sessions to unlock the memories of these strange encounters. And as we might imagine, these sessions brought forward some remarkable revelations. To begin with, Hopkins would focus on the evening in the early 1970s when Terry and her first husband were returning home after a day at the Jersey Shore. The journey home had begun as normal. However, at some stage, Terry's husband had suddenly turned off the main road and headed down several quieter side roads. Terry recalled that although he didn't appear fully himself, her husband made several purposeful turns as if he knew exactly where he was going. Even stranger, Terry recalled how not only did she not ask her husband why he had suddenly taken them off the main road, but both remained completely silent, as if nothing out of the ordinary had taken place. Then, this strange behavior turned even stranger when Terry's husband suddenly brought the car off the road and proceeded to drive it into the middle of a field. Once there, he calmly brought the vehicle to a stop and turned off the engine. The pair remained inside the vehicle, neither saying a word to each other. It was clear to Hopkins from Terry's description of the moment that both were in some kind of catatonic state. The next thing Terry could recall is that several small gray aliens appeared from somewhere and took the pair out of the car, leading them to a strange object that had seemingly landed in the field nearby. A ramp protruded from this craft, which the aliens led Terry and her husband up. Once they were inside the craft, Terry and her husband were then separated. Terry was taken to some kind of examination room where she was relieved of her clothes and then placed on a table in the middle of the room. Although she didn't understand how she knew, she sensed that her unborn baby was the focus of these alien creatures. This, of course, is something that comes up a lot with repeat abductees, and something we'll examine briefly later. These procedures and examinations went on for an undetermined amount of time, after which Terry was led back to the ramp. There, her husband, still seemingly in the same trance-like state as before, was waiting for her. They were both then taken back to their vehicle. The next memory Terry had was of realizing it was suddenly dark and a feeling confused as to why they were sitting in the car in the middle of the field. As her husband started the car, himself equally confused as to how they had arrived there, Terry began to ask him what had happened. Her questioning irritated him, likely due to his own confusion, and he ignored her, making it clear he wished her to be quiet. This, however, was not the only change in her husband's behavior following the strange incident. As the weeks went by, he became increasingly aware, even paranoid, about the security of their apartment. So much so that he would check and then recheck all doors and windows several times each day. Once more, this is an interesting detail that often shows up in other abductees, often before they are even aware that anything untoward has taken place. Betty and Barney Hill, for example, each experienced this following their abduction encounter, long before the abduction itself was clear to them. However, when Terry gave birth to their child, her husband's behavior grew even more intense. One day, not long after the birth of their first child, Terry heard the sounds of tools and chains outside of their second-floor apartment in the hallway. When she ventured into the hallway to investigate, she was shocked to see that her husband had fitted the door with several sturdy bolts and a chain lock, only these were fitted on the outside. When she questioned her husband on the matter, 
he informed her matter-of-factly that when he left for work, he would chain the door and then lock it with a heavy padlock. This, of course, would mean she was, essentially, locked in the apartment while he was away, something that was her husband claimed for her own protection. Needless to say, the pair quarreled over the matter, with Terry insisting that her husband's reaction was extreme, to say the least. Ultimately, Terry would later inform Hopkins that it was this behavior that, as it progressed, led to the couple separating and then divorcing. However, now, years later, she could see where this change of behavior came from and why her husband changed so much so quickly. As Hopkins continued to investigate Terry's abduction encounter, other strange details emerged, details that Terry had not at all connected to these strange occurrences. Perhaps one of the most intriguing of these was her memories of the man who knew too much. And it is those revelations that we will turn our attention to next when Weird Darkness returns. Hey, weirdos. Thank you so much to everybody who has been donating to our Overcoming the Darkness campaign. This makes nine years of doing the podcast, several years of doing this fundraiser, and you guys just continue to surprise me with your gifts, and thank you so much for that. I do have a few people to thank, like Donna, who uh, donated $20, Elsa donated $25, Melody donated $20, Samantha came in with a whopping $50, Michelle donated 5 out of her resources, Francis, 25, Pamela donated 20, and Doris sent in $10. Thank you so much to everybody who's donated. We're currently now at $485 towards our $5,000 goal for the end of this month. So we have a long way to go, but a huge thanks to everybody who's already jumped in and helped us get to where we are. Our annual Overcoming the Darkness campaign is all about depression, anxiety, thoughts of suicide or self-harm. We're wanting to help people to rid their lives of those things. And it's the only fundraiser that we have all year long, so it is pretty special. Again, you can donate by going to WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. And this year, whatever we raise is going to be divided four ways equally to four different organizations that help people who struggle with depression. If you or somebody you know does suffer, well, this is a perfect opportunity to show your support. Go to WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. At his request, Terry began to tell Hopkins of a time when she was 16 years old and still in high school. On this particular day, she was sitting in a pizza parlor with several friends when a man approached their table. He was in his 50s or 60s and dressed in a neat suit and tie. The man asked Terry if she'd like a summer job and if she would like to interview for one. Terry, wanting to earn some extra money, said she would very much like to interview for a job and gave the man her details so that he could pick her up the following day. The following day, as he said he would, the man arrived at her home. At this point, Hopkins highlighted how strange it was that both Terry and her mother were perfectly at ease with the situation. After all, this gentleman was a complete stranger who offered no proof of who he said he was. Nevertheless, Terry left her house and got into the car without even considering that she could be putting herself in danger. However, almost immediately after getting in the vehicle, Terry began to feel a sense of trepidation and even fear rising within her. The man began asking her questions, revealing that he knew details about her that almost no one else did. For example, he would inform her bluntly that although she was happy now, she wasn't happy when her father left something that she couldn't understand how he knew about. He then offered that she had liked living with her grandparents, which caused Terry to ask if he knew her family. He replied that he didn't. He merely knew 
her. He went on to reveal further startling details of her life, even of the previous day. Despite this truly bizarre turn of events, when they arrived at the location, Terry followed the man into what was ultimately an empty office space to conduct the interview. An already strange situation, though, was about to get a lot stranger and darker. The interview began innocently enough, with the man telling Terry that the business would be open in two weeks' time, and that although she couldn't recall the specifics of the business, she did recall that it involved trucks and people. He led her to a desk that he said she would be working from, basically answering the phone, as well as taking messages and keeping records. Then, however, the man's demeanor changed. He began making advances toward her, even placing his hands around her waist. She pulled herself away from him, attempting to make it clear that she was uncomfortable. Undeterred, the man then stated that the job depended very much on her reciprocating his advances. To this, she responded that she no longer wanted the job and that she wished to go home. Rather than flying into a rage, which she fully expected him to, the man backed down and began leading them back out of the room, saying simply, all right, but you are the one I want. The pair walked to the car, and they set off, both remaining quiet. However, rather than taking the route back to her house, the strange man took a turn down roads that Terry didn't recognize. When she asked where they were going, the man replied that he had to stop off somewhere to quickly see a friend. The further they got into the middle of nowhere, the increasingly scared she felt. Eventually, the man brought the car to a stop outside a small two-story house. He went to get out of the car, asking Terry to wait in the vehicle for him. Rather than making a run for it, as the man walked to the house, she simply slumped down in the seat and watched him approach the front door. As Hopkins asked her to view these events further, it became clear that the house was not a house at all. The more she looked at the house, the more it began to change. She realized it wasn't a two-story house at all, but a one level with a smooth roof. The more she concentrated, the more the house looked funny, elaborating that it keeps going back and forth. It looks like a house, then it looks like not a house. Then she made a particularly revealing claim. She offered that the house looks all metal and that there were little windows along the bottom. When she looked at the door, it also looked strange, like an awning, but it's not an awning. She also had some startling revelations about the overall scene, specifically just who the mystery man was meeting. She recalled that there were several other ones and that they were smaller and all looked the same with no hair. By comparison, the man looked like a giant standing next to them. She also recalled that these smaller creatures appeared to have a great interest in her as they all turned their attention to the car staring intently inside at her. Then one of them approached the side of the car and opened the door. As soon as the door was opened, Terry stepped outside, unsure why she was doing so, almost as if she wasn't fully in control of her own decision-making and movements. She further recalled that she was feeling scared, but I'm not doing anything. Although the following details were sketchy and a little disoriented, Terry recalled another of the creatures approaching them and then walking with her. She recalled that there was no apparent destination to the walk, simply that they walked down a dirt road and then walked back again. The next thing she realized, she was back inside the car. We have to imagine that something occurred during this walk. Clearly, what Terry was describing was some kind of meeting between the man and several gray alien creatures. Furthermore, the house, at least what she perceived and recalled as a house, was in fact an apparent disc or oval-shaped object, ultimately a UFO. Following these revelations, Terry recalled how the man simply returned to the car and drove her home. Indeed, there are many details in Terry's account that resonate with other UFO and alien abduction encounters. Perhaps the best place to start with these details would be the bizarre behavior of both Terry and her mother 
in light of this unusual meeting with the mysterious gentleman. Terry would state that in normal circumstances, not only would she herself have been very wary of putting herself in such a potentially dangerous situation with a complete stranger, but her mother would have almost certainly not been so easy with the situation. This would then suggest some kind of mental control over targeted individuals. We might recall that during the first alien abduction encounter with her first husband, Terry recalled how they appeared to be in a trance-like state even as her husband drove the car. Not only is this concerning in that a person could have their actions and emotional responses not only manipulated but overtaken and controlled, but it also suggests a purposeful targeting of individuals as opposed to randomly abducting a person who just happened to be in the vicinity. Just how might this controlling of a person's mind work, and how is it achieved? Is it purely some form of telepathy, or might it involve advanced technology? We'll look a little further at that later on. Whatever the truth of the matter, there are many examples of people who claim or elude to carrying out actions during close contact encounters with alien entities that they are not fully in control of, or of feeling a sudden urge to go to a specific location, even though they don't understand why. As well as this apparent ability to manipulate a person and their actions, there's the fact that this person had a huge and extensive knowledge of Terry. Once more, something that shows up with regularity in other alien abduction cases. There have been several suggestions to explain this, with one of the most likely being that abductees, particularly repeat abductees, are the subject of record-keeping, much like human scientists would keep meticulous records of their experiments. There could, though, be another explanation, simply that the knowledge these apparent alien entities have acquired comes from the person themselves, essentially that the information is extracted from the depths of their own mind. We know, for example, if we accept the claims of many abductees and people who have had close encounters with these alien entities, that the use of telepathic communication is prevalent. If these extraterrestrials are able to use telepathy to communicate, then it stands to reason that they'd also be able to extract the memories of a person, even their subconscious memories, so that they might know everything about them. Hopkins also highlights how the man had an apparent awkwardness to him, suggesting that he wasn't aware of etiquette and how to act in certain situations. It is interesting to note that some researchers, including Hopkins himself, have suggested that the reason behind alien abductions is some kind of alien-human hybridization program. And of interest to us here, many of the alien-human hybrids possess such awkwardness in terms of human interaction. Without a doubt, one of the most thought-provoking details of the Terry Winthrop case is the fact that she perceived what was eventually revealed to be a futuristic vehicle, an alien spaceship, as a strange house in the middle of nowhere. This is a detail that shows up more than we might think in alien abduction and close contact encounters. Numerous people, for example, recall an encounter where they are seemingly talking to a person near a large vehicle, only to recall, often through hypnotic regression, that the vehicle was in fact a spacecraft of some kind. It's also worth noting, at least in some cases, where this illusion seemingly works the other way around, that what the witness perceives as a UFO is actually a helicopter or even a large military truck, as well as what a witness might perceive as the inside of a spacecraft actually being some military base. This illusion is said to be achieved through the use of mind-altering drugs and is seemingly a branch off of the MK Ultra experiments, if of course we accept them to be true for a moment. Could it be that discrete intelligence agencies are using the same kind of technology that these alien entities seemingly use to distort a person's perception in order to cover up their futuristic vehicle and even their appearance in order to have a person perceive something that is no more unusual than an ordinary vehicle as a craft from another world? And if so, how did such speculative agencies obtain such a technology? Perhaps of even further interest, in the same book, Hopkins would explore two other alien abduction cases 
that featured the seemingly throwaway but intriguing details of the fake interview in an almost abandoned office building. We'll look at these cases up next on Weird Darkness. October is the anniversary of Weird Darkness, and we celebrate by raising funds through our Overcoming the Darkness campaign to help people who suffer from depression. Jamie gave to the Overcoming the Darkness campaign a few years ago, and when she did, she left a message saying, I live in the smallest of small towns, and Weird Darkness makes me smile, sometimes uncontrollably. I suffered from depression for the first time after my father passed away in 2013. It was awful. I didn't understand at first what I was feeling. It's debilitating. Also, my child suffers from extreme depression, and I didn't know how to help. It makes you feel useless. Well, of course, he loves your podcast, too, since I shared it with him. Thanks for all you do. To other listeners, come on, people. More donations. We should be able to surpass the goal. Donate, donate, donate. <laughs> well, I can't really add anything to what Jamie just said, except to say that you can donate, donate, donate by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. The first of the fake interview cases we'll look at is another New Jersey resident, Lisa, who had contacted Hopkins at some time in 1986 following her scattered recollections of a UFO encounter, as well as episodes of Missing Time. What's more, like Terry and many other abductees, these encounters appeared to stretch back to when Lisa was a young child. One of her earliest memories, for example, is of being with her mother in the car when she was around seven years old. They had gone to collect a pizza and were returning home. Suddenly, for reasons she didn't understand, both she and her mother felt suddenly confused and scared. They continued on their way and were a little shocked to see her father at the door asking why they had taken so long, clearly worried about them. Even stranger, Lisa and her mother realized they no longer had the pizza with them. Hopkins would regress Lisa, and it was revealed that they had encountered a strange object on the road and were ultimately abducted and subject to several examinations and procedures at the hands of alien entities. What interested Hopkins, however, in light of the Terry Winthrop case, was an encounter that happened when Lisa was 20 years old, something she had discounted as strange but not connected to her apparent UFO encounters. Lisa would offer that she had noticed a job in a local newspaper. Although she could not recall the specifics, she remembered it was some kind of security job. After telephoning the number, she was given directions to the company's offices and asked to attend an interview the following day. Strangely, although she drove herself to the location, she struggled to remember anything about the journey itself. She eventually found herself in a similar run-down, sparsely furnished office space, so sparsely furnished that only a single desk with a telephone on it was visible. A woman greeted her and passed a form to her to fill out. Lisa recalled, however, that when she asked if there was a bathroom she could use, the woman appeared confused, as if she had no knowledge of how to respond, which ultimately she didn't. Remember the awkwardness that Terry described the man who conducted her apparent interview? This would appear to be a similar display here. Instead, the woman quickly led Lisa into another room, again very sparsely furnished, where a gentleman awaited her, presumably to conduct the interview. Before they began, he offered Lisa a drink of water, which she accepted. However, rather than letting her speak, he simply continued to talk seeming to repeat the same things in slightly different ways. Even more amazing, she recalled that she fell asleep at some point while the man was speaking. She was, she recalled, 
in shock that he seemingly didn't notice. Bizarrely, within moments of her waking, the man simply offered a thank you for her time and stated that they would be in touch. Moments later, she was ushered out of the room and out of the building. As she was leaving, she immediately had a bad and ominous feel about the situation. She couldn't shake the feeling that something didn't feel quite right, both mentally and physically. Not only was she struggling to fully recall just what had happened in the building, but she became aware that her underwear didn't appear to be on correctly. Of course, given the suggestion that Lisa somehow blanked out during the interview, then the implications of this are harrowing, to say the least. Hopkins goes on to highlight yet another case of a person who was seemingly in the middle of a repeated spate of alien abductions when she had her own bizarre, fake interview encounter. The woman in question, Sally from Ohio, contacted Hopkins in 1987. Like the previous women we've examined, Sally was also experiencing what was revealed to be several alien abduction encounters. However, during his investigation, Hopkins stumbled onto yet another bizarre interview scenario, and what's more, this encounter would also appear to have been a targeted one. One day, out of the blue, Sally received a phone call from a woman who, rather than asking Sally if she wished to interview for a job, instructed her that she had to go to an interview. She then proceeded to give the young woman instructions on where to go the following day. Bizarrely, even though she found the instructions complicated and couldn't now recall them, she made the journey with no trouble at all, eventually arriving at her destination. Much like the previous women we examined, Sally would find herself in a rundown office with no furniture at all. She recalled seeing several men who all seemed to wear the exact same suit, and a woman who greeted her, presumably the woman who called the previous day. Then another man entered the room. This man starts talking to Sally, at which point things turned even stranger. Sally recalled seeing a strange flash from somewhere inside the room, even though there were no windows. The man continued to talk to her, telling her that the company sold perfumes, before stepping forward and asking her to smell a sample. When she did so, the chair began to spin, at least that is how it felt, and she fell to the ground. Unlike the previous woman, Sally recalled that bright lights began to appear above her, and the next thing she realized, she was lying on her back on a table. Multiple examinations and procedures were carried out, ones that mirrored the encounters she'd experienced during her alien abduction encounters. Then, when they were finished, she was returned to her car. Despite being in a daze, she managed to drive herself home. Just why might this interview process be used? As Hopkins highlights, there are several intriguing connections between these encounters. All the women involved were young women at the time of these interview encounters. The buildings in which these interviews took place were almost always the same, sparsely furnished with a run-down appearance. Certainly not the premises one might expect for a legitimate business. Furthermore, the interviews themselves appeared to be very sketchy and appeared to be more concerned with incapacitating the women involved likely to carry out some kind of medical procedure. Of further interest, despite the women recalling the interviews themselves, if only in part and in a disjointed fashion, none could recall specifics such as traveling to the location or any specifics of the jobs themselves. Although there is no question about the similarities of these encounters, it is uncertain if any other people, women and men, have experienced these scenarios it must surely be the case that they have. And if not, what makes these three women so unique? It's also worth highlighting Carol Rainey's comments about the three women highlighted above, or more specifically, the strange men and interview scenarios they found themselves in. Ultimately, it would appear the people involved in these bizarre interview scenarios were from a recently bioengineered species, essentially alien-human hybrids and it's almost certain that these hybrid creatures are involved in the alleged hybridization program that many researchers believe is the main goal behind alien abductions. 
and we should note that many researchers, including such people as Hopkins and David Jacobs, have arrived at the conclusion that the reason behind alien abductions is the desire on the part of this alien race to create alien-human hybrids. Of course, what the goal might be after this is fully achieved is open to debate. As we can see then, the three cases we've examined here certainly add another layer and level of complexity to the UFO and alien question, and specifically, cases of alien abduction. Might we find that these kinds of encounters are much more widespread than we currently know? Have you yourself ever experienced a strange and curious encounter involving a bizarre job interview that's left you with a sense of confusion? After all, a person couldn't be blamed for keeping such incidents to themselves, especially if they had no inclination that they were a victim of alien abduction. Of course, that is pure speculation, and barring people coming forward with details of such encounters, we have to conclude that the three accounts we've examined here are rather unique. We should also stress that even though the same investigator looked at these cases, Bud Hopkins, the three women themselves had no knowledge of each other or their respective experiences, although they did meet following Hopkins' completion of their cases. If these encounters are unique, then we have to ask why these three women? What makes them special in terms of the alien abduction phenomenon? And how many times did these types of encounters occur? Just once? Or might there have been multiple other similar incidents that have not been recalled? These accounts certainly give us a lot to think about, perhaps above all else the fact that there appears to be much more of a purposeful targeting of certain individuals as opposed to random incidents involving people who simply happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Even in UFO circles, the subject of alien abduction is controversial to say the least. After all, it's perhaps one thing to see a strange object or glowing lights in the sky, but to claim to have forcibly been taken aboard these strange crafts by alien entities understandably takes a considerable stretching of the imagination. That's not to say that these claims should be dismissed. There are, of course, many accounts that span decades and stretch across the world that share such similar details, often seemingly trivial details, that we've come to the conclusion that something is taking place and that we can't simply dismiss people who make such claims as liars or crazy. Might there even be a connection between these apparent extraterrestrial encounters and mind control? particularly those experimented with by the CIA in the MK Ultra programs. As we will examine, there are many cases that hint heavily at mind control techniques used by the intelligence agencies in alien abduction cases. And taking that a stage further, especially when we note the many cases that speak of a human or military presence during these apparently alien encounters, is there much more of a human involvement than we might think? Is it possible that at least some cases are the work solely of some dark but very terrestrial and human agency? When we factor in the notion of alien implants and the capabilities of our own modern world, these cases take on an even murkier turn. In the book Underground Bases and Tunnels – What is the Government Trying to Hide? Richard Sauter discusses in part the possible involvement of secret government agencies in alien abduction and implant encounters and possible human-engineered mind control. I've linked to the book in the show notes. As Sauter points out, there are numerous alien abduction cases that hint at a human presence, perhaps even human control of the bizarre and terrifying encounters. He states that whether it may or may not be true, that extraterrestrials are behind these alien abduction cases. It may be the case that at least some of the alien abductors are actually terrestrial humans working covertly, he says, and that they could be working under cover of artificially induced states of total or partial amnesia, fear, and screen memories. Sauter highlights how this could be achieved, from something as minimal as a mask and makeup so as to be made to look like a certain alien 
Sauter uses a reptilian as an example, but a typical gray alien would also be equally recognizable to most people, to using much more sophisticated technologies so as to cause hallucinations, or even the use of psychoactive drugs, general hypnotic methods, and even using microwave radiations. Perhaps one of the best examples of a discrete human involvement in alien abduction encounters might be an encounter that occurred along the A-70 on the evening of August 17, 1992. On the night in question, two friends, Gary Wood and Colin Wright, were driving on their way to Tarbrax just outside Edinburgh when a strange object descended out of nowhere over the road before directing a curtain of white light in front of their car. There was much debate, at least initially, on the witness's part as to what exactly happened next. They would later find themselves in a different part of the road and missing a considerable amount of time. Ultimately, through the use of hypnotic regression, it would be revealed that they were taken onto the craft by several small humanoids. They would find themselves in a strange room with dazzling lights before then finding themselves in a featureless room. What followed appeared to be several experiments and examinations of the two abductees. Of most interest to us here, though, is that Gary would recall the presence of a mysterious man, a human who appeared to observe the strange procedures from a far part of the room. He appeared to be wearing a collar and tie and had a military presence about him. What is interesting is that there was quite an interest by the British authorities in the case. Might this interest have been much more active than many might suspect? The fact is that this is just one such case that hints of a human involvement in alien abduction encounters. We'll turn our attention next to one of the most famous encounters in UFO history, one that happened decades before the A-70 incident, and one that hints not only at human involvement, but one that recent revelations suggest the use of mind-altering substances being used to manipulate the witness's perception and sense of reality. There are certainly plenty of examples that hint at mind-altering substances being administered or techniques being employed during UFO and alien abduction encounters. Perhaps one of the best might be the alleged 1957 alien abduction of Antonio Villas Boas, who claimed to have been abducted by strange entities in the São Francisco de Salas region of Brazil while working on his farm. He would further claim to have met a beautiful humanoid woman while on board who he claimed he was gently coerced into having sex with. Even stranger, before he left, this seemingly alien woman suggested to Boaz that they had conceived a child as a result of the act. As bizarre as the encounter seemed, even to many in the UFO community both at the time and since, Boaz never once wavered from his version of events until his death in the early 1990s. However, in more recent years, new, intriguing information has surfaced regarding the case, mainly thanks to researcher and author Nick Redfern, who relays this information in the book Top Secret Alien Abduction Files – What the Government Doesn't Want You to Know, which I'll link to in the show notes. Redfern highlights the revelations of Bosco Nedeljkovic, who informed UFO investigator Rich Reynolds of the details. Not only did Nedeljkovic work for the CIA for many years, as well as other United States agencies, he was also in Brazil at the time of the Boas incident, which perhaps makes his claims all the more credible. He would claim to Reynolds that the Boas alien abduction was not an alien abduction at all, but was in fact an orchestrated kidnapping, which several intelligence agencies of the United States were behind. What's more, the sole purpose of the abduction was to test how much the human mind could be manipulated using a combination of props and mind-altering drugs. It was essentially an in-the-field experiment of the MK Ultra program. According to Nedeljkovic, the UFO that Boaz witnessed descend toward him was actually an unmarked black military helicopter. However, due to the spraying of chemicals over the field where the farmer was working as they landed, he perceived the helicopter as a UFO. Once he was incapacitated, he was taken to a secret location with several rooms inside, and several other mind-altering drugs were administered which would make him believe he was on board a spaceship. 
the female alien with whom he had sex was a local prostitute who was under orders as to how to act and what to say, including the insinuation that they had conceived a child. Further drugs were administered before he was returned to the spot where he was taken from, before he was returned to the spot where he was taken from, before he was returned waking to see the UFO helicopter rising above him. It is perhaps interesting to note the use of the female alien and the fact the two had sex while on the apparent spacecraft. Although a lot less otherworldly, we know that intelligence agencies would often use a combination of mind-altering drugs and the services of prostitutes with their targets for a variety of reasons, not least so they could use a particular sexual act that had been committed for blackmail purposes or to ensure a person's silence or cooperation. Might the Boas case have been a continuation on that, albeit for a different end goal? We might also turn our attention to the fact that many abductees recall being told to drink strange, often colorless liquids for a variety of reasons, but that usually includes wiping their memory or possibly replacing the events with a false recall. For example, one of the most famous cases of repeat alien abduction is that of Betty Andreessen, who would claim that following several examinations by her apparently alien hosts, was told to drink a strange liquid that she was given that would have a tranquilizing effect on her. What is also of interest, and a side note to what we're discussing here, are the claims from Andreessen that she was taken to an underwater base that contained a museum of time containing different examples of human beings throughout history. It's not clear if these were models of some kind or real humans in suspended animation. Incidentally, both the underwater base aspect and the record-keeping of human history are details that surface in many other alien abduction accounts. Another intriguing example of these strange liquids is that of Kevin, who informed UFO researcher Martin Jasek of his own alien abduction encounter in September 1987 from the North Canal Road in Yukon, Canada. During his abduction encounter, he was given a glass with a yellow liquid in it. He was told to drink the fluid as it would make him forget the encounter, something that he was told was for his own good. In this instance, Kevin claimed later that he very much wanted to remember the incident, so he took three small sips from the glass before discreetly putting it to one side. Around a decade earlier, another abduction case with an almost identical detail occurred. On the evening of June 19, 1978, the Mann family were seemingly abducted by extraterrestrials while driving along a lonely road in southern England after a brilliant white light suddenly descended on their vehicle. After seemingly blackening out for a short time, the family would awaken on a different road with no memory of having gotten there. Interestingly, John Mann would later state that he had a strange feeling that the car was almost driving itself. Even more interesting, they noticed a strange, glowing object that appeared to remain with the vehicle for the majority of their journey home. John Mann would later undergo hypnotic regression in an effort to recall that missing hour on the road just outside of Oxfordshire, as well as the fact that both he and his wife Gloria and their daughter Natasha had several vivid and intense nightmares of strange beings. Ultimately, Mann would recall being taken on board the ship along with the other members of his family and of undergoing several experiments and tests before being shown images on a strange screen of the apparent alien's crippled home planet. Even stranger, though, before they were to be returned to their car, the family were given colorless, fizzy drinks that they were told would help you forget, adding that they must forget or you will be exploited. Were these the same alien entities who Kevin encountered in the Yukon just short of a decade later? An even earlier example might be found in an apparent 1952 alien abduction when a resident of Burbank, California, Orfea Angelucci, encountered a strange silver disc that landed in the road in front of his car. Just prior to the disc's sudden arrival, Angelucci had felt a bizarre and intense tingling sensation that took hold of his entire body. When the disc moved away a few moments after appearing, the sensation suddenly stopped. 
However, in its place were two glowing spheres, which then morphed into humanoid beings, one a man and one a woman. The most intriguing detail to us here, though, is that one of these humanoids handed him a goblet that he was urged to drink from. When he did, it relieved his unpleasant sensations. Although it wasn't drunk, the administration of a strange liquid can be highlighted in an apparent abduction encounter that occurred in Hokkaido in Japan from the early spring of 1970, although the account perhaps began several years earlier in 1967 during a trip to Jerusalem. And what's more, although it is, of course, only speculation, might not only show another alien abduction encounter with connections to strange liquids, but also human involvement. Gene would claim that at some point during the trip he suddenly felt possessed by a strange entity, so much so that he believed he was not completely in control of his own decisions. In fact, for the next three years, he would travel from place to place around the world and did so upon the instruction of this strange possessing entity. By early 1970, he found himself in Hokkaido. Then things turned even stranger. He was told he would rendezvous with his brother, his homologue of the other cycle of terrestrial life on the summit of a nearby mountain. After climbing to the summit each day for several days, he was eventually greeted by the arrival of a large, spaceship-like craft, which he entered when it landed. Not long after entering the craft, and of particular interest to us here, Gene was told he would receive an intravenous injection of a rosy liquid before he could go any further. This was, as he was told, for his own protection before he proceeded on into the spaceship. Might we consider, if we assume the account is accurate for a moment, that at some point during that trip to Jerusalem, he was not possessed but rather put under some form of mental control by discrete intelligence agencies, possibly through the administration of mind-altering drugs, which then planted some kind of slow release of information. Might this kind of long-running mind control over many years have been the experiment? Once more, as bizarre as it sounds, at the same time it is not that much of a stretch of the imagination. In fact, this aspect of being called to UFO encounters is something we will turn our attention to more fully when Weird Darkness returns. October is not only our favorite month due to Halloween and it also being the anniversary of the podcast, but for me, it's the busiest month. October crept up on me fast this year, and on the last day of September, I was scrambling to get things done late into the night. Because I knew it would be a late night, I grabbed a Magic Mind performance shot in the late afternoon and it gave me the mental clarity, alertness, and motivation I needed to get everything done before October rolled in. I'm relying more and more on Magic Mind than the energy drinks I used to live on. Not only does it work better and last longer without the energy drink crash, but it's also a healthier alternative. Fewer calories, fewer carbs, tons of essential vitamins, and that added benefit of a small dose of caffeine for that kickstart I need when starting my day. I became a subscriber, so I would never accidentally run out of Magic Mind. It's that effective for me. And because you are a Weird Darkness weirdo, you can try Magic Mind and get it at 48% off your subscription. Visit magicmind.com slash weirddarkness and then use the promo code DARKNESS20 to get the deal. If you'd rather just try it without a subscription, this code will also work for a one-time purchase and you'll get 20% off. Make Magic Mind part of your daily routine and you will definitely notice a difference. Again, visit magicmind.com slash weirddarkness and then use the promo code DARKNESS20 to get 48% off your subscription or 20% off a one-time purchase. MagicMind.com slash WeirdDarkness, promo code DARKNESS20.
There are many people who make claims of being culled by these apparently extraterrestrial encounters. And these callings come in a variety of different ways, from a strange person simply arriving out of nowhere and instructing the person to a certain meeting point, to sudden telepathic communications or even compulsions that do the same. It is perhaps interesting to recall the thoughts of the late UK UFO researcher and one-time police sergeant Tony Dodd, who, after seeing a UFO for the first time in 1978, would often drive around the lonely roads of the Yorkshire Moors. What became of much intrigue to him was that when he did choose to embark on these drives, he could see something strange more often than not. He began to wonder whether he was somehow being called to take these drives, even if it was subconsciously. One of the most intriguing of these is an incident that can be found in the book From Deep Within the Archives of UFO Insight by Marcus Louth, which I have linked to in the show notes. While we won't go into the account in full here, it's worth going over the basics of the Vienna Woods incident in light of our topic. The incident comes to us from the files of the veteran UFO researcher Timothy Good and involved an account relayed to him by a friend who he studied with at the Academy of Music in London, a friend he would only refer to as Bobby. The incident occurred while Bobby was studying in Vienna in October 1962. He would begin hearing strange sounds that he described as immensely smoothing, as well as telepathic messages and mental visions. One particularly strange incident occurred while he was practicing violin and the sheet music disappeared before a superimposed picture of a green forest environment replaced it. He would eventually set out to the location shown in the vision, without really knowing where he was going, instead acting purely on instinct, claiming he was being guided in a particular direction. He would ultimately find his way to the Vienna woods. As he entered the woods, he recalled that he was being guided in a particular direction. Despite how deep he went into the forest, he felt no panic whatsoever. He would eventually find himself in a clearing where a saucer-shaped craft landed nearby. Three strange humanoid creatures would approach him, interacting with him for some time, even making apparent predictions about Bobby's own future before re-entering the craft and disappearing. If we return our thoughts back to the connections of mind control to alien abduction, we might be best served to return our attention back to the work of Richard Sauter, who notes that as well as the many reports of abductees being told to drink strange liquids that will seemingly blank their memory, there are many other details typical of close contact alien encounters that could further suggest mind control techniques. For example, perhaps the most repeated is the apparent almond black eyes of the alleged aliens, eyes that seem to put those who look into them in a strange, hypnotic, trance-like state. Another detail that's often associated with such encounters is the hearing of a strange whirring or humming sound. We know that certain sounds, especially when repetitive, can often contribute to putting someone in a hypnotic state. What is perhaps interesting here is that many close-contact UFO reports state that these vehicles move without making a sound, but the detail of a strange humming is often reported in the immediate moments before these strange crafts appear close to the abductee. Might this suggest, then, that this sound is very much aimed at putting the person in a trance-like state? The presence of Flashing and often hypnotic lights also come up in accounts of alien interaction or abduction, as does the presence of strange pulsing in the air, as well as strong aromas that suggest the presence of some kind of gas. All of these things detailed above are of use to those with a knowledge of hypnotic and mind control techniques. And before we dismiss notions of mind control, we might consider how easy it is for a run-of-the-mill stage hypnotist to put people under their control. How simple repeated advertising influences many of our daily decisions, whether we realize it or not. Mind control is very real, and it just might be the case that it is used in at least some of the alien abduction encounters that continue to be reported. We might note the notion of being called goes back throughout history, most likely to the very beginnings of civilizations. 
For example, there are a plethora of examples in any number of ancient religious writings that speak of angels and messengers of God. Might these divine messengers, if we assume they existed for a moment, have actually been some kind of extraterrestrial mind control communication? If this is the case, then we might suspect that aliens have had an active interest in human affairs for many thousands of years, perhaps even longer than that. And if that is true, then we perhaps have to reevaluate what alien abductions might be. Are they a continuation of interaction between aliens and human beings that have gone on since the beginning of civilization? Or might the apparent aliens that are visiting Earth today be just the latest in a long line of beings from other worlds over the course of thousands of years? Of course, if these types of communication and mind control techniques have been taking place for thousands of years, then what does that say about the human presence in alien abduction encounters? Might there have always been certain humans who act as a buffer between the vast majority of humanity and these alien entities, perhaps in the same way that certain humans were granted audiences with the gods in the legends of ancient times? Might this human presence actually be a disguise of the aliens themselves, designed to appear human, and if so, why? We might consider also certain encounters of the modern UFO era where many of the contactees go on to issue warnings of nuclear war and the dangers to the environment. Might these apparent attempts to influence human beings in ancient times be happening still in the 20th and 21st centuries? And might the human presence be a continuation of using a select few individuals as go-betweens, if only discreetly? We'll return to some of these contemplations shortly. First, though, we will turn our attention to alien implants and where they might sit in this already twisting enigma that is the UFO and alien question. In terms of implants, certainly around the notion of alien abduction, we usually view these things as futuristic devices, and given the fact that many of these appear to dissolve into nothing when they fall loose or are removed, we might be right to. However, the fact is such technology is already available to us, and has been, for decades. How many of us, for example, have had such tracking devices placed in our pets? Taking it a stage further, many employers have offered such implants to be placed in their employees' hands in order to use it as ID, with the scope potentially able to be expanded. And what's more, the technology used for these identification implants matches many descriptions given of procedures carried out in alien abduction encounters, sometimes decades before this technology was available. What is perhaps also interesting is that these identification technologies used in animals feature intricate digital databases which can be used to discover the exact whereabouts of any single animal. These technologies are used mainly to track the migratory patterns of certain wild animals, which can be used as clues if their numbers suddenly decreased or increased for any number of purposes. However, the simple fact is if these implants were placed into people, we could be tracked in much the same way. As Sauter notes, the possibilities and implications for political and social control are both obvious and enormous. We should make clear this is not something we are suggesting is happening on a wide scale, but might it have an element of truth with at least some of the recorded alien abduction encounters? We should also note that these implants can be used, at least in theory but based on legitimate and accepted research, to actively influence a person remotely. And while research into this, at least officially, is relatively limited, there's the possibility that these implants, if they were administered in a mass way, could be used to radically change a person's behavior, perhaps even having them hear voices instructing them in their heads, or by sending images and instructions to their subconscious, having them act on these subconscious messages. Perhaps one thing of interest about many alien implant accounts from the 1980s and 1990s is that they would often drop out of people's bodies and then dissolve in the most bizarre way. Given how durable the implant used on animals are today in the 21st century, if we assume there is a human connection to at least some alien abduction encounters, these earlier cases have been the result of less long-lasting and durable implants, essentially 
earlier prototypes of what has seemingly been perfected today, perhaps. Might it be the case that these alien implants, whether their source is one of an extraterrestrial origin or a terrestrial one, could be used on abductees for similar reasons? To track certain people's movements or even to influence their behavior? What the purpose of alien implants might be is very open to debate. Some researchers believe they are used just the same way that many of us use them with our pets, to track them should they become lost. Might these implants be a way of giving whoever is carrying out these abductions, whether it is aliens or a top-secret intelligence agency, the ability to find their target at any given time? We've reported before of the belief by some UFO researchers that the aim of alien abductions is to produce some kind of alien-human hybrid, and this could very much be the case. David Jacobs and Bud Hopkins are but two such researchers who have made extremely compelling arguments that this is the reason and end goal of the alien abduction phenomena. Do we assume that taking steps to attempt to block the memories of these abductions is a moral one on the alien's part? While it is a possibility, we might assume to enter into such a program essentially against the will of the humans involved would mean such moral concerns would remain unaddressed. In short, what would these potential alien abductors have to gain from saving their specimens from the harrowing memories of their ordeals. However, what if we assume that these alien abductions are the result of human beings as opposed to extraterrestrials, which we'll explore a little further next? We would imagine, then, that the perpetrators would very much have a lot to gain from ensuring those involved in the program recalled as little as possible about the experience. Might it suggest, then, that there is some kind of human breeding program, possibly one that operates across and with disregard to international borders and certainly outside the widely accepted human rights of the world. As Richard Sauter points out, such a speculative organization, whoever they might be and where they might work from, would have to operate in absolute secrecy, perhaps even from the governments of the world. And the use of mind control and mind-altering drugs to distort the memories of those they abduct, as well as the use of implants to track each and every one of those who have unwittingly and unwillingly entered into this speculative breeding program, would all go to maintain such secrecy and even deniability. Essentially, while it might be easy to dismiss claims of alien abduction as nothing but intense dreams and hallucinations, if we consider that these undoubtedly bizarre encounters are being carried out by a dark human agency under the guise of extraterrestrial visitors using drugs and mind control techniques for unknown reasons, then these assertions should be of concern to each one of us. It is to the persistent claims of a human presence during alien abduction encounters and what that means where we will turn our attention next, when Weird Darkness returns. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. If 
if there was a human presence in these many alien abduction incidents, what might that mean? Does it mean that these encounters are nothing more than human-led abductions for reasons unknown that are masked in the most extreme way with such bizarre implanted memories? And perhaps more importantly, what might the reasons for carrying out such missions be? Does it lend potential credence to the assertions that many of us do operate under some form of mind control, as preposterous as the notion is to most? As unlikely as that might be, we should remind ourselves once more that the technology and know-how, at least potentially, is already available to us. And while it is most unlikely that such a widespread operation would have taken place over many decades, it's certainly not impossible. Perhaps even more so if only a small number of the population is targeted for such a speculative experiment. Might we consider that this aspect of targeting is where implants and possible aspects of mind control or calling come in? So as to conduct a widespread experiment hidden behind the notion of alien abduction, which would in turn allow those involved to deny such outlandish and bordering on absurd claims. And if this is the case, that these encounters are by and large the result of human-led experiments, are the many reports of strange craft that move in ways unknown to us be the genuine result of advanced vehicles, or are they the result of mass mind manipulation? Or might this human involvement be one that is of equal involvement with a genuine alien race? Might it suggest, for example, that there was some kind of deal secretly worked out behind closed doors? Are the respective aliens and humans, often military personnel, often reported by witnesses exactly as they recall them to be? If so, is this human presence there in an observing or even supervisory capacity? possibly to ensure abductees are treated with pre-agreed-to conditions. There are, after all, many UFO researchers who suggest that a deal for alien technology in return for access to the members of the human population was agreed to in the mid-1950s. And while there's no solid proof of this, it is perhaps interesting to note that the technological revolutions began shortly after, while at the same time, alien abduction cases began to be reported, even if only from a speculative point of view. Or might this human presence have something to gain as much as the extraterrestrials themselves, possibly working together toward some kind of unknown but shared end goal? It would be hard, even for the most open-minded of us, to accept that such a world-changing secret could be kept out of the public arena for such a long time. However, we might also note that the fact we're discussing the notion due to alleged leaked documents and whistleblower testimony might suggest that the secret has not been so masterfully kept, even if most people reject, perhaps rightly, such claims. Whatever the connections and reasons might be, the fact that there is an apparent human presence during many of the alien abduction encounters on record means we should keep the suggestion on the mental back burner at the very least. Perhaps we're best served to wrap up this episode by using the thoughts of the previously mentioned Richard Sauter, who stated that there were multiple groups, both governmental or private, that have access to the money, personnel, equipment, materials, and expertise to stage a convincing alien abduction episode. Sauter continues that these agencies include, but are not limited to, organizations from the police, major corporations, various intelligence, military, and government agencies, right the way up to giants such as the United Nations and NATO, and even international crime syndicates and fraternal orders. Indeed, the UFO and alien question has the potential to take us down connecting avenues we didn't even know existed, much less travel down. We might also consider the more positive experiences of alien abduction, those that tell of pleasant interaction, warnings of humanity's collective behavior regarding such things as nuclear weapons, and the general disregard for the environment. While these kinds of potential abductions, or perhaps a better word would be encounters, still occur today, they were seemingly more prevalent in the 1950s and early 1960s accounts. As the 70s and 80s unfolded, 
alien abduction encounters took on a more consistent, ominous feel to them. Might these also be a part of some highly secret and long-term experiment carried out the same as those, speculatively, behind the often reported harrowing type of abduction involving medical experiments? Perhaps even used as some kind of control to the far-reaching experiment or program? Or might we consider that these positive abduction encounters are themselves a result of false memories purposefully implanted? We asked earlier, for example, what an alien race carrying out these experiments would have to gain from implanting false memories to replace a likely terrifying encounter. Might it be simply to build up a certain amount of trust and, in turn, control over the abductee, particularly if that abductee was to be abducted several times? Or might these positive abduction encounters be engineered so as to have those who experience them speak about them and pass on a predetermined message? Or might these differing alien abduction encounters be simply due to the fact that there is, as some UFO researchers have suggested for some time, multiple alien races visiting the Earth all the time? Whether there is a connection between mind control and alien abduction, something that implants might play a key role in, is a debate that will continue to be contemplated at least by some in the UFO community. Ultimately, as we ask more and more questions regarding the UFO and the alien question, the more questions arise. Indeed, we might imagine that the interactions with human beings and aliens from another world would be a complicated and drawn-out affair, much different, for example, than the ideas of flying saucers landing on the White House lawn that was presented in many of the early science fiction movies of the early UFO era. If, though, at least some of the alien abduction cases are the result of human-engineered mental manipulation, possibly involving mind control and the use of implants, then the entire question of what UFOs and their apparent occupants might be becomes distorted in the extreme. Might many of these alien abduction encounters be nothing more than a continuation of the MK Ultra mind control experiments of the intelligence agencies of the United States? Experiments, remember, that were also worked on by Nazi scientists during the Second World War and were then, at least partially, transplanted to the United States through such missions as Operation Paperclip that saw the Americans and the Soviets scramble to grab the finest Nazi scientists for our own ends following the end of the conflict. Perhaps one more thing to consider, and something that altogether makes the already murky waters that much murkier, is that many of the alien abduction encounters could be very real, and that these early abduction encounters were then seized upon and used for the purposes of such bizarre experiments. Such a notion would put the battle for information on two different fronts, forcing us to consider a wealth of other possibilities and possibly diluting research and thought into one particular area. Indeed, this might even be the design by those apparent shadowy agencies that appear to pull the strings from behind the scenes. There's perhaps so much to consider when we look at what the truths might be around the UFO and alien question. Perhaps too much for one podcaster alone, but certainly not beyond our collective efforts. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Weirddarkness.com is also where you can find information on any of the sponsors you heard about during the show, find all of my social media, listen to audiobooks I've narrated, sign up for the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host, visit the store for Weird Darkness merchandise, and more. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. 
All stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Luke 11 verses 9 and 10. And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. And a final thought. Never regret a day in your life. Good days give you happiness, bad days give you lessons, and best days give you memories. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.